Welcome to my talk. Today we're going to be talking about cookies. So if you're here for something else, then you've gone into the wrong room. Uh, my name is Siren. Oops. And I don't know how to work my slide deck. Yay! Shortest talk ever. <laughs> OK, let's try this again. There we go. Yay! <laughs> So my name is Siren. Um, I am the head of security uh, for a medical company in Sweden. Um, I would describe myself as a security enthusiast, which means I'm, I'm stoked about my job. I like what I do a lot, and it tends to show. Um, I talk a lot about technical security, and my particular passion project is trying to get more people involved in security. That's where I really feel like that's, that's my goal. Um, so I always try and make security like a, a fun, approachable topic because I am of the strong opinion that not enough people come into security, not enough people feel like they can do security, whereas everybody should be doing security, and especially now that we have the GDPR, which says, you know, security is a must. And everyone's kind of like the pained smile because all of our inboxes last week exploded with, we've updated our per, you know, terms and conditions and our policies because we care deeply at the last possible second. Yes, we care deeply, the last possible second. So these slides are actually in order. So for anyone who's seen me present before, my slides are usually hideous. Um, but there is a developer that works at my company that did a talk on GBT tokens, and I loved his theme. And so I asked to borrow it, and he gave me it. So this is his theme. His name is Bjorn Leiksman on Twitter. And he very generously gave me this template to use for my talk. So if you've seen his talk on YouTube, I didn't steal it. I stole his template with his permission. Um, so I just wanted to start by thanking him, who very generously, he's a front-end developer, an amazing person, and makes these beautiful slides that I apparently fail to operate correctly. So go me. So th a big thank you to Bjorn, because again, I would be completely lost without him. So when we talk about security, this template really is tall for me. <laughs> it really is. It's awkward. So when we talk about security, um, I usually talk to developers. And there's, there's, a, there's three very distinct groups that hear, that hear security talks. And the first one is other security people. And I tend to avoid security conferences because it's, it's, it's talking to an echo chamber of everyone sitting there and agreeing with me, which is I'm trying to teach people. And if everyone always knows what I'm talking about, I don't look cool. And since I work in security, looking cool is my, my go-to. Movies tell me it's important. The second group of people is embedded developers and back-end developers who think that everything I say is irrelevant because it can be crushed at the kernel level. And they're right. But again, they're a small niche. Small niche. Um, they're completely correct, and this talk is not for them either. So they can go elsewhere. And then there's the vast majority who hear a talk like this, and they look at code examples, or they hear what I'm saying, and they sit and they go, I would never do that. Because I don't write in that language. I don't use that framework. I don't work with apps, backends, frontends, mobiles, IOTs. Whatever the example, they will find something that proves that they are not that person that made that mistake. And for the sake of this talk and for the sake of that person's ego, sure. Sure. Fine. I, I, won't, I won't engage with the argument, but developers do not work in a utopia. They do not work alone. And all developers have dependencies. So I will engage in the argument and that premise of that person if they are the developers that has no external dependencies, uses no external libraries, and has done absolutely everything themselves. Then I will agree. To date, I have not met that person. If you are that person, please raise a limb. I am looking at the second tier of audience, and there are no limbs up for the camera. So if you're sitting in this talk feeling like, shit, I'm not that dumb, Fine, you may not be, but dude or dudette on your right or your left may be having an off day, may be new, may be tired, and so it's not you, it's us. We need to do this together. And so security is a project of we, it is not a project of me. And this is why security generally struggles, because tech, childishly, 
sometimes has the emphasis on me, 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 I am cool. Security struggles with this a lot, so it's not just a tech, it's everyone. And this is why we need to shift from it's, it's not just you, it's all of us. A short history of the cookie. Dun, dun, dun. So the cookie um, was invented by a man in 1994 called Lou, I'm not even going to try that last name because I'm going to mangle it. 1994, he worked at Netscape, and he named the cookie after the fortune cookie. I'm not sure how big the fortune cookie is here in Europe, but I grew up in the United States where it was a big deal. And a fortune cookie, for those of you who don't know, it has a message inside. So you break the cookie, and there's a secret message inside. And if you're childish in 10, you'd read the secret message out loud, and then you'd end it with, in bed. Because <laughs> that was, you know, you were 10, and it was funny. So they wanted this to kind of improve the static the staticness or the static content of the pages that they had. And it wasn't very large. And there weren't very many of them. And this was, you know, the dawn of the internet. But they realized it was a pretty successful concept. So Internet Explorer followed Netscape's bold example in 1995, started following them. And it started to spread more and more as people realized it was pretty cool to be able to have, like, you know, things that actually stayed. That was great. And so the first request for comments came out in 1997, believe it or not. 1997. As a response to the security concerns that had started to pop up. 1996. So 1997, they have the first request for comments, and it's not particularly great. So they try and fix, they try and fix it in 2000. They try and fix some of the privacy concerns, some of the confidentiality concerns. 2000 doesn't really go great. They realize they probably have to have some sort of edited level of security, because cookies at this point were chiefly used by marketing people who care deeply about security, as we all know. Deeply. Deeply. If you read their pamphlets, they do. It says in all of their pamphlets that they care deeply. They won't tell you how, but they care deeply. So in 2002, Microsoft introduces the HTTP-only cookie, and Internet Explorer boldly follows three years later. Why such a diff? Not so sure. Cookie has unfortunately struggled with its request for comp, <laughs> you know. So 2011, they try it again. Still struggling. This should give some of you pause, because we start in 1994, and we still haven't figured it out by 2011. That should be slightly concerning. So privacy was probably why we were struggling. Cookies got a lot of media attention for all of the wrong reasons, because marketing cares deeply about your security. Interestingly, there was an article in the Financial Times in 1996 called, This Bug in Your PC is a Smart Cookie. So 2000, 2006, 1996, they realized that cookies that could track you and could identify you were probably, from a security perspective, not that great. So they were like, all right, we're going to fix it. We're going to solve this problem, 1996. So they put in a uh, request for comments saying that third-party cookies were not allowed. Do you remember I was talking about the rest request for comments 1997? This was this. Third-party cookies are not allowed. Guess who thought this was super, super bad? I've mentioned them, and they care deeply. Yeah. So that was very efficiently squashed. And thus ended that idea. So Netscape and Internet Explorer and all the other browsers at that time, yeah, marketing gave them a lot of money, and did people really care deeply? Yeah, no. No, they did not, according to them. So new request for comments came out, and you could use any third party that you wanted, ever, because that would never cause any problems ever, right? So that was in the United States. EU thought, you know what? No. No, no, no. We care deeply. And this came, the EU cookie directive. All of you have probably seen it. It's that annoying pop-up that everyone gets away from. Everyone has seen it? Looks kind of like this. Mm -hmm. 
Not a, I'm not here to talk about either this policy or the GDPR. So if you're like, oh god, a legal talk, um, no, this isn't it. Not a lawyer. Um, so the cookie law was incredibly fuzzy. It was not written by engineers. It was not written by technical people. So if you read it, you're just like, this is unimplementable. I can't do this because how are we going to deal with consent? And so the cookie policy kind of died because they determined that implied consent could probably do it. And so they made the banner smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It was still technically there. So they solved the problem. Out of Curiosa, I'm bringing up something that none of you have probably heard. It's called P3P. It was an old, outdated protocol. Has anyone heard of this protocol? Really? Wow, that's actually super cool. So what was neat about this protocol is that it required you to implicitly state why you were going to use this data. Is this ringing any GDPR bells? Anyone implicitly stating why you need to use data? You weren't allowed to just kind of vacuum up whatever you wanted. Died horribly. Now obsolete, no one uses it. So another problem was that, well, not everyone was required to have it. It only had a small subsection that required its use. Everyone else could do whatever you wanted. So oddly, this protocol was wildly unpopular. Can't tell you why, but that's the way it is. Now you're feeling like this is far afield. We are here to talk about cookies, and the only thing this lady has babbled about is law. I'm going to comfort you with some nice code. So breathe easy, breathe easy. Here we go. Local storage. We're going to start with a little bit of background. For those of you who don't know, local storage can look like this. There are two variables stored here. It's username and favorite color. Mine is red. This was introduced in HTML5. Local storage is great because it can run independently of a web server. You don't need a backend language or anything like that. It's pretty, pretty flexible. It doesn't have the same size constraints as cookies do. So everyone if you're a developer, thinks local storage is pretty great. However, there is a teeny tiny problem with local storage, teeny tiny, and it is JavaScript. Local storage was not designed to be a security mechanism at all, at all. So local storage is basically a very large JavaScript object that's sitting in your browser just kind of hanging out. And the problem becomes, those external dependencies that I was talking about. Because if you have any JavaScript that links to any of these things, and I've never found a website ever that doesn't, then a mean person, a person with a ski mask, an itchy, itchy ski mask, or the anonymous mask, which I don't understand why you would wear that either, can screw your stuff if you're fantastically unlikely. So if you have something that looks like this, something dumb, whatever it happens to be, and that gets compromised, say, the little ending library there, mini field, I could mine your local storage and send it to an external API, and you would never know, ever. And that would suck for you. And the reason I bring up local storage is because the largest offender of my local storage, I think I was describing this as a rant or a scree before, is that I find a lot of GBT tokens in local storage. Yes, and if I can take that, then you're going to have a terrible, terrible time because that is basically a username and password. If you're lucky, it's encrypted, so I can't read it, if you're lucky. But I found them being encrypted with MD5. <laughs> yeah, and everyone laughs, and they're just like, oh, ha, 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 I would never do that. And I bring you back to, it's not you, it's us. So, ah, oh, ha, 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 you should be silence. <laughs> Because it is not you, it is us. So cookies. See, these slides are great. I can take no credit for these. This is all Bjorn. Like, all of the nice slides, they're not me. What are cookies, actually? And this is kind of where I think people get hung up. So I've added some extra text, because I know this is going to be filmed. So I've added this so I can share my slides. You can have a cheat sheet, because I think it's important to have a cheat sheet. But mainly, they're a tiny, tiny little text file that you can save. That means your back end doesn't have to constantly ping the front end. Great. They're pretty simple. You can only use them in string. 
they're not as flexible, and they're also not encrypted, which is a big, they're not default encrypted, they're not somehow magically safe, and people get them confused with a lot of other functionality because they're so ubiquitous. So we're going to start this talk with some definitions, shall we say. A credential is something that describes an identity. Username and password is a credential. Authentication means that I actually log in. Authorization means I'm allowed to log in. And claims are things about me, things I'm allowed to do. They can be permissions or statements about me. We're all on the same boat on what I'm going to be talking about. I haven't lost anyone. Very good. Now, part of the problem with cookies is that there are a lot of ambiguities about cookies. Why, you ask? Because there are 18 zillion requests for comments trying to fix a problem that was discovered in 1994, and we've decided that we're going to fix it in the next release. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. When does a cookie session expire? Seriously, when? I, I see, I don't know. Can a secure cookie be set from an HTTP page? Yes. Some are people. Yes. There we go. So would you say that's a clear statement? Sort of. Exactly. That's the reason it says ambiguities rather than like cold hard facts. <laughs> So yes, it's, it's totally ambiguous. Can HTTP only be set from client side? And the fact that like, there's only one brave person, and thank you for that, by the way. So gold star. I love people that talk to me. Um, this, this is a problem, because this is something that we all use. This should not be ambiguous. If a secure cookie is set from HTTPS, is it later overwritten? Can it be overwritten? Domain and path, same origin versus, hmm. See, and everyone's looking a little lost, and that should give you pause. And HTTP only has a huge number of, of flaws that have been introduced because of these ambiguities. And I wish I could say that this talk is going to solve all of these ambiguities. And if enough I knew the answers, I would be paid a lot more than I am. And I would have some sort of like gold star by my name and I would be, you know, Lord of Cookies or something. It would be it would be amazing. So I can't solve any of these questions. There are solutions that are very unit specific or very type specific or very app specific, but there isn't like a standard. There isn't the usual best practice. There isn't the usual anything which means cookie implementation could get really, really confusing really, really fast. Very important, cookies and sessions are not the same thing. People get them confused because session cookies are a thing, but cookies and sessions are not the same thing. The main difference between a session and a cookie is session data is stored on the server, whereas cookie is stored in the browser. Main difference there. And sessions are way more secure because it's stored on the actual server. But because there are session cookies, people tend to get them mixed up. And this should be kind of obvious, because in a browser, you can turn cookies off. You can't turn a session off. So if I'm ever confused if it's a cookie or a session, I just turn off the cookies, and then I know. <laughs> Problem solved. So we're getting into the crowd participation section, which I always do. I don't know how this is going to go in this country. So Maybe if there are a few brave souls that can just participate with me, it's going to make it a lot less awkward for me. All right? So just bear with me. I'm also sick, so you have to kind of like pity, pity me here a little bit. So pity participate. All right? We got a true-false. Cookies marked as a secure attribute are only sent over HTTPS and therefore are safe from man-in-the-middle attacks. If you think it's true, raise your hand. Brave souls. All right, pretty good, pretty good. So the secure attribute only protects the confidentiality of the cookie, unfortunately. There's no integrity protection. So while I, as an attacker, can't actually read the cookie, 
I can write and change it. So a network attacker can't actually go over after those cookies. What? Why would I go after them? Because if it says false, I can't log in, I really want to. <sighs> I'm a jerk like that. I'm a jerk like that, that's why. Next one, HTTP only. Cookies marched with HTTP only attribute are not accessible from JavaScript, and therefore, you can just ignore cross-site scripting. Hand up if you think this is true. Oh, you're going to try and like make my, my question harder here. No, I'm not cutting the server, just for the sake of clarity. Otherwise, my question is going to get really complex. So we're only looking at the client. Do, 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 do. So we're all going to go with false, and you would be correct. HTTP-only cookies can be replaced by overflowing the cookie jar on the client side. You'll just bomb it with no cookies, and you'll replace them. And it sucks. And it's very fun to do, but it sucks. If you're trying to defend from that, it sucks. Path attribute, which I mentioned earlier. The path attribute limits the scope of cookies to a specific path on the server and can be therefore used to protect, prevent excuse me, unauthorized access to it from other applications on the same host. Hand up if you think this is true. No one thinks this is true. Very good. Or you're just not brave enough to put up your hand and be that person being like, shit, <laughs> it was me. And this is, this is actually a trickier one, because this is mixing up two concepts. This is cookie scope versus same origin policy. And they're two different applications, but they're shared on the same host. And cookie scope is path. Origin is port and protocol. Very, very different things but they both have host and domain. So why is that important? So say you have a head domain, and you have several subdomains under it. If there are some subdomains that are under a head domain that you should absolutely not access, you have to make sure your cookies are correctly set. By a show of hands, guess how many people actually do that? One person. Thank you, brave sir. That's about as many websites. If, this is, if you're all a website, that's how many websites have done it correctly. One. <laughs> Good for you. Your, your employer should be pleased and give you a raise. <laughs> the domain attribute. The domain attribute should be set to origin host to limit the scope of that particular server. I helped you a little bit in my rant. For example, if the application resides on a server my app, mysite.com, then it should be set as listed. Yes? You're like, I didn't realize this was a test. I was here to learn. Jesus. So when the domain is set, the cookies will be sent to that domain and all of its subdomains, all of them. The risk with subdomains is lower when it's scoped to the parent domain, but it's still relevant. So if you remove the domain attribute and limit the cookies to the original host only. Tiny little side note here, IE will always send to the, the subdomains regardless, because IE sucks. I mean, it's a great, it's a great browser that does something. I'm not sure. It does, it does stuff. Final true false. The testing is over. A session cookie known as an in-memory cookie, and I've never heard anyone call it an in-memory cookie. I've only heard it called a session memory cookie. Or transient cookie, never heard that either, exists only in a temporary memory while the user navigates the website. Wow, you're like my new, like, I have a question. No, I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm so excited. Like, the wor my worst audience is always when everyone's just, like, staring at me. Just like, I'm like, is this bad? Is this good? Um, as long as they're using it, and then they close the browser. Hand up if you think this is true. 
You can be brave. I'm not, I'm not like taking score. <laughs> we think it's true. We think it's true. It's not true. It is not. It is up to the browser to decide when the session ends. Non-persistent cookies can actually be persisted. So you can actually set a session cookie to live on after the browser dies. It sucks. What? Edit This Cookie is amazing. It's a great plugin, and it has a cute icon, which for me is always an important fact. <laughs> so if you're trying to market me something, the cuter the better. And I will be like, purchase. Cute kitten, cute puppy, I'm done. So you're here for the security, so don't worry. I got the stupid photo. The stupider the photo, the better, because I hate marketing photos about security. Like, no one would ever do this. Like, I have, like this just looks uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> like, if there was a picture of me, like, pen testing, it would be me in, like, a onesie. I have an awesome onesie that's, like, fl like fluffy in the, on the inside. It's awesome. And then it would be, like, me, like, laying in my chair and just being like, nope. Nope. Damn it. <laughs> and, I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not fancy. So. <laughs> all Bjorn, all Bjorn for that amazing photo. This is not me, all Bjorn. Man in the middle attacks, public Wi-Fi. How many of you are on the Wi-Fi to this particular place? <laughs> Fun. Uh, how many of you are on the Wi-Fi in this particular place without a VPN tunnel? Now no one's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I realized that was a terrible idea. Yeah. Always use HTTPS. And people think that HTTPS means that they're safe forever. But if it's a public Wi-Fi, something nasty or someone bored can be on the router and have a fun or terrible time with your stuff. So me to you, tip from me to you, if you're on a public Wi-Fi, VPN tunnel. VPN, 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 always. Otherwise, you're stuck looking at cute icons like this. And then you're going to have creepy laughter in the background. And, that's, and I'll just be like, hello. Cross-site scripting. And I feel like every developer ever is sick of hearing about this stupid bug that never, ever, ever dies, ever. Cross-site scripting is if you have running code on your website. And because of JavaScript, and because of cookies, and because of local storage, the problem has gotten worse, not better. And I wish I could be here to tell you that, like, do these three things and you're going to get, oh, wait, I can validate your inputs. Done. See? Told you I was going to bring it up again. <laughs> um, if you validate your inputs, it's not a sexy thing to say, but you'll actually get rid of cross-site scripting. You really will. And I know it's not a black hat, DEF CON, cool, like, exploit thing to say, but it's true. And when it comes to cookies, it actually makes a significant difference because I actually have to get in somewhere. And a script, if you don't let scripts in, then I'm just going to, I'll just swim away. I'll go to some easier target. And that's really what you want. It's not a very human response to be like, go hit the weaker person. But that's what you need to do. And when we're looking at third party stuff, you, we have to have a better understanding of what we're taking into us. We have to actually look at our dependencies. So another poll, just because I'm curious and you've been indulging me, how many people actually look at their third-party libraries and, and dependencies on a regular basis? Raise for those people with the hands up. How many people are lying because they're afraid of my judgment? <laughs> I like the guy who was like, ooh. <laughs> But that, that's odd, isn't it? Because we're like, we have a security focus, or we know we should be doing security, but I'm just going to copy paste from Stack Overflow, because no one would ever do that. Yeah, no one would ever do that. Um, and, then we, and then we kind of wonder, like, why these hacks keep coming back. And then we go to DEF CON, and we look at Black Hat, and we're just like, oh, it's all kernel anyway. I, I'm not an embedded developer. Validate your inputs. Please. Please, please, please. Everyone tells me, like the lady this morning, or this afternoon, sorry, um, I don't know where to start in security, and this is it. 
cross-site scripting is the third most dangerous thing out there. Third. And if you can get, my personal favorite is the attack where I will steal your cookie and I will make a nice pop-up window that says your login was, you know, whoops, can you log in here again with your username and password again? And it has a 98% success rate. 100% JavaScript cross-site scripting cookies. 100% of the time that would have been stopped by validating the inputs and having better control of the cookies. It's not very sexy, but there it is. Cross-site request forgery. Yeah, see, great slide, not mine. <laughs> my, my words, my, not the template, because the template is amazing. Cross-site request forgery is the one-click attack, and this one is horribly misunderstood. How many of you have seen the, are you sure you want to purchase whatever it is pop-up? Uh, please go here to, you know, please confirm that you actually want to do this. Have you seen that? Most of, most of us have seen it at some point. Mm -hmm. That's a cross-site request forgery security mechanism that's popping up. And cross-site request forgery is if I can recreate the URL, send it to you and have you click on it, which means that you're executing my attack. I need cookies to do this, and I need a good understanding of the URL to do this. The way to stop me from doing that is sending something unique per request or screwing up the URL. Also cookie-based. This one isn't stopped by validation input, but it's almost the same thing. So now you're just like, all right, so everything is you know, doomed, and JavaScript is going to kill us all, and this is more depressing than I thought, and I didn't realize there was a test. So. What to do? I have already mentioned one of them, so I'm putting it in large text in case someone can't read. HTTPS, always, 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 always. And there are services like Let's Encrypt, which means this is free. There are some, impl there are some impl implications and some maintenance work that need to happen, but that's true for anything and everything. So simply saying we can't do it because there's a cost associated is, is simply not true. If you, if you have a pool table or a ping pong thing at work or whatever, you can borrow five minutes of ping pong to do this. Let's Encrypt has an amazing cert bot that you can use. It is not hard. But there is always a but. If you're on public Wi-Fi, HTTPS is not going to help you, so use a VPN tunnel. Thank you. There are a couple good implementation strategies that you can look at. This is one where you set the cookie as HTTP only, secure, and then you set the domain, and it's specific. So what happens is a user logs into your website, and you create a session identifier, them, session identifier for them, and you store it as a cryptographically signed cookie. When I say cryptographically, I do not mean MD5. I do, not, I do not mean an algorithm that you yourself have thought of. I do not mean an algorithm that your neighbor has thought of. It's an AES, it's an RSA, it's something that's you know, industry known. It can't be you know, their name plus one. I will figure that out. So something slightly harder than that. Then you make sure whatever cookie library your web framework is using is also setting HTTP only. You actually have to check that. And this flag makes it impossible for a browser to read the cookies. It really does. Then you have to make sure that your cookie library also sets the same site strict cookie flag. And this is the one that prevents cross-site request forgery, which was the little trash can with the cookie on it that was super cute. Yeah. So every time a user makes a request to your site, you use their session ID which is not the same as cookies. Session cookie, not session. And you ex extend that cookie, and you retrieve their account details from whatever database you're using. And once you have the, account, the user's account info pulled up and verified, then they can safely swim on. And you can send that back and forth, back and forth. See the little cute cookie there? And that's a safe and sane way to do it. If that one didn't speak to you, you can do it this way. You can store it in a cookie and send it as a header. 
And this one's JVT tokens because I was bashing on them earlier. So I've tried to be slightly more accepting because I know that they're staggeringly popular. So this is also an implementation strategy if you like JVT better. So now you're thinking, she's brought up all of these horrible things that cookies can do and all of these weird settings. Is there an ultimate cookie? Is there the ultimate implementation? And to my knowledge, this is the safest way to set a cookie. This is the best way to do it. This gets rid of cross-site request forgery and cross-site scripting to an extent. Security is a gray area. There are very few cases that I can ever be like, if you do this, you're done. Ta-da! But this is the safest way to do it. Now, I'm sure there's some tester in the audience thinking, but me. So testing. Secure attributes are something you can test on a cookie. You can use, use this edit this cookie or whatever it's called, cute little cookie. Whenever a cookie contains sensitive information or a session token, it should always be passed in an encrypted tunnel, always. HTTP-only attributes should always be sent, even if the browser doesn't support it, because this is the attribute that aids in securing cookies from being accessed by the client-side script. Domain attributes. Verify the domain has not been set too loosely as per my main domain and subdomains that are just kind of all over the place. And it should be only set to the server that actually needs to receive the cookie. I know that in tech, it's kind of popular to be like, we're going to make this ambiguous so that we can grow with speed. Security struggles with that idea because I like things to be structured. So grow with speed, but not with insanity. And finally, the expires attribute. And this attribute is set to a time in the future to verify that the cookies does not actually contain any set the sensitive information. And this is something you can set yourself, which leaves us with login. After you log in and log out, should a session cookie still be in local storage? Of course not, says the bold, bold gentleman. The bold gentleman is correct. I like the bold gentleman. By a show of hands, how many people think that the cookie is still there? It, it does depend on the website implementation. The correct answer is yours. Unfortunately, you are a minority of people. I am sad to say. I am very sad to say. Local storage does have the ability to delete it automatically in session storage. It's a function that you can call that deletes local storage after you log out. You can literally write it into your implementation that you don't have to think about it anymore. How many people do that? Mm. Not as many. So I have seven more minutes, because this is my thank you slide. Um, I really appreciate you all patiently putting up with my true and false questions. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that you've participated in this talk. Um, I know that this can be kind of a topic that everyone feels like, shit, it's a big deal. Um, and I don't really know where to start, and I get that a lot. Um, and I say this at every talk that I give, and it's more true the longer, the longer I've been speaking, the more true it becomes, is start small. Start with one tiny input field, start with one attribute on a cookie, start with one implementation strategy, and just secure that one. And it feels like you're not making an actual difference, but you actually are, because if your colleagues see that you're actually putting work into security, it's more likely that they too will do it, unless you work with a bunch of jerks, at which point you should get another job. And I, I mean, that's not a security problem, that's just a you deserve better problem. And tech is always a lucrative field, so there's always another job, so, you know, take your pick. But security is a huge, vast discipline that needs more people. And so I welcome you to just try something, try anything. And cookies are an easy place to start because they're so ubiquitous. They're used everywhere. So you will literally fall over a bug. Like you, you'll just trip over it. And then you can go to your boss and be like, I did a security thing. And since security is so popular and now we have GDPR, which mandates proactive security, you might get a raise or a gold star or something. I don't know, an ice cream. I like 
ice cream, gummy bears, whatever. Um, so it, it is something that you can proactively do that doesn't require a, a degree in like rocket engineering. Because it's not hard. It is these are the paths that we should be setting. These are, these are how they should be set. Do we do that? Yes, no. There are nice plugins that you can use. So now I have six minutes for questions. Do I have any? Shoot. I love that idea. And CSPs are only as good as the way they are maintained. And if you look at the classic CSP, it's white. Content security policy. So a content security policy is supposed to say, these are the JavaScript libraries I allow. Anything that is not on my list, and you can do this whitelist based, which is a maintenance problem of depending on how large your application is, it can grow exponentially. You can also do this in a non-spaced fashion, which is harder to set up in the beginning, but gives you a great deal more flexibility and it's not as difficult to maintain. But, and this is always the big but, if you have a library that's external and it becomes compromised, what are you going to do? You shouldn't use external libraries, and then I mean, but th but that's an impossible business case. We're going to do everything ourselves. It, 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 you could download and serve everything yourself, fair. And if your boss lets you do that, I would like a job, because <laughs> my job would be much easier. My job would be so much easier. Um, but it's like I said, a content security policy is going to help you, but it's not going to solve the problem. But it's a good question. To those of you, some of you looked really confused when I said non-spaced white CSP, because it's kind of newish. Google did a really, really good paper on it that I can recommend you all to read. It's written in language that you can actually understand. So if you search for non-spaced CSP, thumbs up. Other questions? Go ahead. Yes, there is. There's a bunch of them. You can use security scanners. Uh, the one I recommend for new people is something called Zap, Zap, Z -A -P, Attack Proxy. It's a free tool that's put out by OWASP. If you're a backend or an automatic tester, it runs brilliantly in headless mode, so you can build it into your testing suite. And it'll literally scan your site and give you kind of like the low-hanging fruit. Just like any other automated tool, it does have false positives. So you, know, you can't run to your boss and say, I have 3,000 bugs. Um, so it does require a bit of, I'm going to go with tender, loving care. But it's absolutely a good tool. Now, I have to say this. Hacking is illegal. Please do it on your own stuff, blah, 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 blah. There you go, because you know I have to. <laughs> However, there are, if you want to get started, Zap Attack Proxy, uh, OWASP puts out DevSlop, uh, C Shepard, uh, Damn Vulnerable website, Damn Vulnerable iOS application. So there are a lot of tools and a lot of websites that are specifically made to be broken that you can you know, wail on to your heart's content. But please, you know, legally speaking, hackling is illegal, blah, 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 blah. I've said it. You've heard it. There we go. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, Non-spaced. Yes. So think null. Nonce is another word for null. Other questions? Shoot. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting the second row. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Can you trust your browser? If I understand your question is more, can I trust my browser and can we forget about cookies to an extent? Would that be a fair? Can I, is, is the question, can I trust Mozilla and my browser to keep certain things about me? Or what's, I guess I don't understand your question. You can. Yes, and they're totally different. I think it could, I mean, it really depends on what type of thing you're trying to build and what type of data you're try, trying to present. So I think if you have a lot of high-risk data, not storing any data on the browser is definitely a good, a good idea from a security perspective, because then you have maximum control of all of your data. Is that a fair answer? OK. Other questions? All right. Well, then, I thank you very much for your time. Oh.